Hi, everyone. Welcome to Forbes Talks. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Mark Penn, who is chairman and CEO, Stagwell Inc., Chairman Harris Poll, of course, chief strategist, I think, in two campaigns. Is that right? Two presidential campaigns and advisor to Microsoft and Ford. First of all, Mark, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And the last time we spoke, I believe you used the word sewer next to Twitter. And when I checked your latest tweet, you seem to be um, look, feeling a little more optimistic now that Elon Musk is making his presence felt. Is that fair to say? Well, I, I see all these folks saying, oh, my God, what is what is Elon Musk going to do to Twitter? And I'm going like, where have you been? Twitter has been a sewer for a long time. Uh, it, it, as a as an institution, it had the lowest rating of any of the social media or major, you know, almost any major corporation. Uh, it was seen as a place that precipitated mobs of people that enforced speech and ideology codes and got people fired from their jobs. And so this is going to be worse. Well, I, I think people have to give Elon Musk an opportunity. Maybe he is the rotor rooter. Uh, as I've said here, come in to clean up the sewer uh, and provide some balance here in terms of free speech uh, and eliminating, you know, speech that 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 is uh, that is beyond the pale or inappropriate for various reasons. So I guess you could take the nowhere to go or but up argument. But let's uh, start with this whole Twitter files, for example, that came out. Um, is it a ho hum? I mean, it doesn't really seem to have been as earth-shaking as the Facebook files, for example. Well, you know, today the news media covers what they want to cover, and they simply ignore what they don't want to cover. I mean, I'm in the news media. I'm covering it. It seems to me pretty clear that, uh, you know, something like, hey, these tweets we should remove, and somebody from Twitter saying, I'm on it, that's pretty devastating. It shows that there was a regular course of conduct of, of at, at that time, at least the Democratic Party being able to write to Twitter uh, and, and get an almost immediate response that things they didn't like would be taken off or shadow banned. And, uh, and later on, I guess the very close coordination with government once the administration took over on key issues. So I think the Twitter files are significant. They revealed what everybody suspected, which is that the that the tools that were designed for child pornography were really instead being used for a political censorship operation. And frankly, my my own experience with the institutions. Did they ever censor you? Um, I don't think I was censored politically, but I, I have a political game 270. And I had a long fight with, uh, with Facebook over whether advertising for my game was political advertising. And everyone at the top said it wasn't. And everyone on like election integrity commissions somehow reversed it and didn't let me advertise a simple game where just people play Hillary Clinton or Trump or whomever, you know, uh, and it's a game and it had no political content. So I, the censor's pen is a dangerous pen, right? And when you give it to a bunch of kids, uh, who are who are who are running major tech organizations? The opportunity for abuse is so much bigger than people realize. So, I hope it gets constrained. I hope it becomes rational. Uh, we can't let bots control our life, and we can't let people without really, you know, sensible people really determining what should or should not be moderated. Well, as somebody in the marketing space, though, you called Twitter a sewer. Um, that sewer, I'm assuming, is because it was essentially a place that was filled with, you know, hate and yahoos, et cetera. How do you how do you make Twitter a platform that a Ford or a Microsoft is like, yes, get me on there? Well, first of all, advertising was never a big part of, of Twitter and Twitter advertising was really not the most effective advertising. So all this hullabaloo about it, I'm not quite sure is... It's the business model that's the problem, not the, not who's on it. Is that it? Well, you know, the advertising itself really was not as effective as advertising on Google or Facebook uh, because of the way used people use Twitter and the way the advertising was positioned. I mean, one of the jobs I think that Elon Musk has is to redo how advertising is displayed you know, how do you avoid the problem you just said if you don't want advertisements against, you know, rough and tumble uh, content? 
you you want it under you know aligned with certain content so you need a better uh organization that puts the ads in the right places and you need a, a better kind of ads that actually work so i i think that that's actually part of the job that that he's got to do because the organization was just simply you know not only was it a sewer but it was also losing lots of money so i want to stay on this a second because i think it's fascinating which is if you're giving pro bono advice to elon musk what i mean He's now got the Twitter files, like maybe there's part seven, eight to come. But what are some of the moves that he should do that would really win people over like you and more importantly, your clients? Well, I always remember the scene from Citizen Kane where he puts up a declaration of principles after buying the paper. And at least in the beginning, he was idealistic. Right. Uh, and, and, and Ron actually, had a great uh, set of principles, too, right? Well, that's what Elon Musk has to do. He has to stop making policy day by day, set out a number of clear principles, put them down, post them, and let people see how he plans on running it. Right now, it's a little snippet every day, and that's no way to come in here and reset the organization. That would be job number one, as far as I can see. Anything else you'd suggest? Because I, I want to actually, since we're talking social platforms, I want to move on to TikTok because that's a, another fascinating piece of news this week with regard to, you know, first of all, it's the gift that keeps on giving in terms of scandal. How how are you thinking about that platform right now since it is the most popular with Gen Z, certainly? Yeah, look, I, I, I think uh, that, that the platform TikTok is, is going to face some headwinds here and so they're going to have to answer some questions how is the data secured and can americans be assured that it's not going to the chinese government if they can get over that hurdle and make it clear then i think they could probably forestall you know any significant congressional actions and there'll be a social platform just like others if they don't kind of i think climb up that mountain i think they you know they, they could have problems so we did see this bipartisan bill. I think uh, Senator Rubio introduced. I mean, that feels like I don't know if it's wishful thinking. Is it possible to just? I mean, it's starting small, but ban TikTok. Is that doable? Well, Congress has a long history here when it comes to technology of doing absolutely nothing. Uh, nobody seems to understand it. They they never get together on anything. So. Uh, so that you know, lightning could strike and Congress could pass this bill, but but I'm I'm kind of rather dubious that they're going to like uh, get angry letters from 50 million Gen Zers. Uh, I think instead they got to focus on the real issue: what happens to the data? Get get real answers, uh, and the administration should kind of kind of resolve the that situation so that so that people can have a you know competition in the industry. Remember. Competition in the industry uh, for advertising is important, right? Because otherwise, if you if you wind up taking out Facebook's competition, then of, of course that'll mean higher ad prices in a time of recession, which is bad for consumers. So this is the time of year we like to look ahead to 2023. Do you have any predictions for um, who's on the rise, who's on the wane? I mean, what's uh, you know your betting man? What What's on your radar? Well, I think there's all sorts of interesting stuff, you know, in store in 2023. I don't think I think it's going to be an exciting year. Will to go through the topic we were just talking, will Elon Musk get back to number one richest person in the world? Right. I think uh, I think he will if he can clear up, uh, clear up Twitter and fend off competition in EVs. Uh, Look, I think obviously Ron DeSantis is on the rise and Donald Trump has been on the decline. Those those moves are have been highlighted in really stunning polls that came out the last couple of days that showed that Trump, who was beating uh, DeSantis handily by 20 points in primaries, is now losing by by 20 points in some of so so you know he would have to make one of the comebacks of, of the centuries. Was that mainly the consequence of the midterms? I mean, that's the impression. Is there anything we're missing there? Because that that is a stunning shift. Well, the midterms, the 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 dinner that he had with you know anti Semites, and the 
then on, 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 you know, on top of that, putting that like, you know, maybe there should be a redo of the election that violates the constitution. I mean, the whole thing, you know, is, is, is needs a complete reboot. And I just, you know, I'm a little dubious. I'm a lot dubious actually that, that, that Trump is going to, going to figure his way out of, out of this one. And, you know, look, I think you also have to look, you know, this 2023, it could be the year of both recession and recovery. I mean, people are looking, you know, if things happen as people expect, the brakes are going to come on here, but then the brakes are going to come back off. And so by Christmas next year, things are better rather than rather what than worse. What does better look like? Is better less inflation? Is better more stability? What What is your better version of lower better? Interest, lower interest rates. <laughs> okay. So it's the interest rates. Let, let me, if I can for a second, just because I'm curious, go back to Governor DeSantis, because again, I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm just out there, American citizen, but but I never seems good when there's a big. You're an early contender in a U.S. Uh, presidential campaign. You've got experience with this. Um, what are the perils? What what are you looking for as to whether this is actually the man to beat? Uh, look, front runner status, as you point out, it's always a kind of a dangerous thing because everybody decides they're gonna they're gonna dump on you. Uh, but Trump is really regarded as the front runner here. So, so in the in the David and Goliath, really, DeSantis is the David, and and Trump is the Goliath. So, so I think that it's a little different from the typical situation. I think that they've been looking to pick on DeSantis. I think I think he made a mistake, uh, you know, wading into the into the same sex bill. He should have kept away from that one. Uh, you know, I think he's running heavily in a Republican primary, so he's tilting, he, you know, he's tilting to the right before he'll tilt back to the center. But uh, yeah, uh, they haven't found anything. Look, they they pretty much, I'm sure right now there, there are 50 to 100 people combing through like, you know, his grade school teachers and, you know, notebooks if they can find them, but they haven't found anything yet. It's, it's interesting, you know, if people actually care at this point, but, but, I do want to, um, you know, there's a lot of curiosity, whether it's just shifting, you know, sort of the, the way we do primaries, but with, go back to the start, the Twitter files, Hunter Biden, you know, the Biden administration, is there anything that you're looking at right now as indications of, of what's going to happen in 2024, or do you feel like Biden's the man and uh, whether we like it or not, make your decision? Well, Jill Biden is the woman, right? Who is really running things here, right? It's you think Jill Joe Biden, Biden is? is really the pivotal figure, and I think she is kind of coming out endorsing the run, which I'd expect because, look, first as a president, you've got to maintain the fiction that you're not a lame duck for as long as possible, and second, I suspect she is playing a much bigger role, you know, than than people realize in in carrying out the the administration. So. Uh, I, I look, the president is going to have to get through Hunter Biden hearings. If he makes it through that, you know, he might actually make it to the nomination. Uh, I think that's probably his biggest test. But remember, the economy here is faltering. A lot of people are going to get more and more upset about the economy, particularly if unemployment rises and there's going to be Democratic competition. Look, I think this is time for return of the governors, whether it's DeSantis or whether it's the Newsome, or whether it's some other governors that we haven't thought of yet, I think, I think people want a president that has leadership experience and executive experience, and that they realize that this is a job that shouldn't be done by somebody who runs beauty pageants, and and then who was just in the Senate, and, and I think we're pretty changed in that. I'm shocked that you say Joe Biden. Is it? Are you seeing indications in the same way that like a Hillary Clinton? um was when she was first lady to to bill like what what's making you think she's um the power behind the power here well because so many of the positions that uh, joe biden's taken are so at odds with anything that he believed in his 50 Such as years what? In so somebody's got to be be driving that and and somebody's got to be 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 talking him into that and where where he wound up here which was which was pretty far from the center would there be any particular positions that come to mind? I'm just curious. I'm genuinely, like, what positions are at odds with what you know to be 
his beliefs. Remember his single bill that he did that was his bill was the crime bill. <laughs> mm. So every position he's taken on crime, on immigration, on, on some of the, you know, I think he's he's continued to stick with his policy on Israel. I think which which is one of the exceptions, and and you know, so and and I think the extreme support, you know, with the teacher unions and and other positions, been again, not really in character. Although he's just, he was was generally very strong supporter of the manufacturing unions. So, but I, I do think you see you see a departure here. She's going to apparently make some comments that you know tilting in the in the direction that she's become more favorable towards him him running again. And like I said, doesn't surprise me. But uh, on the other hand, it wouldn't surprise me if if we wound up with uh, neither Trump nor Biden. I've written that neither Trump nor Biden should run. Right. We well, we talked about that. What what about you know as a former vice president? Um, you know would he be looking favorably or should we be thinking more about Kamala Harris? I mean, I'm just curious. Well, I think the question will be, you know, what happens through these Hunter Biden hearings? Is there any possibility that a year or so in that that you'll see something like what happened in New York State where Harris will become president and then she'd be really well positioned? Uh, if that doesn't happen, I think there'll be open primaries and in both these places, it'll be a pretty, you know, things won't pick up here until, you know, late, uh, you know, sort of September uh, and October of of the year of 23. And when the debates start to occur and then and get your popcorn, you know, enjoy the extended political season. Uh, and I think the unpredictable will always come out of these things. What, what are you seeing from consumers and, and by that? consumers, citizens, however you want to characterize um, people, like what are obviously concerned about inflation. There seems to be a bit of a fatigue about politics. Maybe it's just this hangover we get when we've gone through the midterms. But what is on the radar right now that people should be paying attention to, especially business leaders, that perhaps is underappreciated in terms of sentiment? Well, look, social media companies may be under pressure, but technology is moving forward. Every company is becoming a digital company. Every company is becoming a digital marketing company. I think this will be the year, perhaps, of the augmented reality glasses that come out of Apple. I, I think I think it's a long time overdue for uh, augmented reality to kind of burst on the scene. I think people are looking for something new. They're beginning to get a little tired of their phones. I mean. You know, other than like flip around and turn over and whatnot, the phones, you know, seem to do just the same thing. So I, I, look, technology continues to dominate people's lives. People continue to use technology as where they spend their time and how they execute their purchases and, and transactions. So any temporary slowdown you see or anything pullback you see or don't see in advertising, doesn't shouldn't obscure that the march of technological improvement, achievement, and reliance among consumers is the dominant part of of the of the of consumer life here. Didn't we have Jeff Bezos tell us that we should be buying a little less? Did you catch that? What I don't I what do I make what do we make of that? I mean, you know, if we're gonna be truly sustainable, I suppose circular economy and all that, we should probably be buying less from Amazon, but um, is he right? Um, I love that. That was the, when oil companies would say to use less gasoline. And <laughs> and they put a sunshine, remember BP was at sunshine. It's like, wait, aren't you an oil company? When did you become a solar company that's all about mothers, you know? Amazon CEO says you should buy less from Amazon. I mean, I, I don't know how to take those things. Uh, those things seriously. The, the the march towards online purchasing. Look, people have an opportunity now to go back to the stores, to have a retail experience, uh, and for them to kind of establish a you know a balance between online and offline. I don't know that online is going to get a lot better, right, than it than it has. I mean, delivery is pretty fast. I mean, you know, I I, I you know I hate to use anecdotes, but uh, we love anecdotes. People love anecdotes. Give us an anecdote. Uh, look in my in my own building, the number of packages that come every day, right, from Amazon and other retailers is in the hundreds. 
And so we had to hire like two people just to handle those packages. And and that just didn't happen before, right? Before people went out and bought it and brought it back in. And today people sit on their phone and they order it to, to an incredible extent. And so, so every company, as I've said, has to become a digital marketing company because like it or not, some combination of DTC and online ordering may, you know, it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 70% of their sales. Right. And, and, and they've got to figure out how to do that profitably and well. I don't know if there's anything else, you know, holiday or otherwise, a lot of people I'm talking to speak now about a new normal in terms of pricing, inflation, what's happening in China, that um, whether it's, excuse me, <clears throat> labor costs in the U.S. or supply chain issues that Americans have to get used to a new normal of paying more for things, services, et cetera. Is that, are you seeing that? Or are you, are you hearing that from your clients? Because um, it's, it's been a motif that's come up several times in the past week. Well, I, I think that's the big question. Uh, does it in fact turn out that this period of obviously restrained growth, high inflation, you know, problems with the supply chain, people making almost irrational, you know, decisions, uh, people moving themselves out of the workforce, you know, is this all transitory, but not transitory in months, but maybe a year or two, right? Where do we want to get back to? We want to get back to stable inflation. We want to get back to higher growth, right? And we want to get back to kind of the, the kind of the advancement that everybody felt before the pandemic. The pandemic was a major disruptive you know, event, a once in a century kind of event. And the notion that we could get over it in a couple of months was maybe just misplaced. So I don't think there's going to be a new normal. I think there's a longer period of disruption and resettlement. But but the goal has got to be get whether it's two or three percent inflation, you know, here we've got to get to lower inflation, but we can't restrain the economy from growing. We can't restrain the, the country from bringing, you know, growing population wise as well. And, so you're uh, an optimist. The other thing I would highlight, right, right, not to not to be underrated, but the you know the fusion discovery, you know, if you uh, if you look at the at the at the at the at the coming out of the Department of Energy here, the the ability to get power, you know, out of bringing the uh, hydrogen atoms together into helium, that could upend all of climate change, right? If we have the patience to really pursue that, so. So you're you're an optimist. I feel like this time of year I should be asking you what's keeping you up at night, since you seem, I think, to be relatively, you know, uh, I'd say optimistic about the future. Everybody's worried about the same thing. Are we going to go into uh, a, a, a deep recession here caused by an overreaction? A Fed policy because they didn't understand that transitory meant like 18 months instead of three months. Uh, and, and are they going to essentially give us all chemotherapy and, you know, where the treatment will be, you know, as bad as the disease? You know, I mean, that's what keeps everybody up. When you look at these numbers, you know, with three quarters of the people being unhappy with the economy, it means companies have to show that they can deliver value oriented you know, products that they can provide, you know, discounts and sales, you know, that, that people like, that it shifts the whole advertising and marketing too from what you do in a growth economy to having to take market share and being somewhat more competitive in terms of the way you market and understand things. So I think those are all the, those are all the things in the, in the short term. We just don't know whether the short term is going to turn into the long term. But that will be the topic of the September debate. Let let me let me um, end by going full circle back to politics because tough times does te tend to be an opportunity for people to appeal to our baser instincts or our fears. Um, is that the, the extremism that we've seen, um, if that's the right way to put it, is that likely to continue? Do you think that's um, in, again in your experience going into what's going to be a very competitive? you know, political season again, uh, how likely is it that um, we will see the types of extremism, frankly, that have characterized the last few campaigns? Well, I guess as the eternal optimist, 
I think this campaign actually will be a turn away from extremism, a turn towards you know government by people who know how to govern, uh, and and consequently, I think that the winners of the debates that start in September and and you know and the, and that political season are likely actually to be ones that put extremism aside. Now, each party will call the other person extreme, no matter what they are. But what? I do think this is about the return to the center. It's it were because we're we've just been too burned by what by the ex, you know what is it that makes you think we're going back to the center? That's not conventional wisdom. Well, because a it's where most of the voters are. B I think we've seen the voters reject both the uh, the the extremism of the squad and the uh, you know. Marjorie Taylor, green extremism as well. So I think we've seen a, in the rejection of the Trump candidates. And I don't think the rejection of the Trump, Trump candidates was a was a hugging of the Democratic left. Quite the, quite the opposite. It says the center is where the country is. And I do think this notion of, wow, this job's pretty complex now in a time of turbulent foreign affairs uh, and a difficult economic situation. Maybe we really need somebody, you know, who's more right. level headed, uh, who we can count on. Yeah, no, good, good, uh, good predictions. Look forward to continuing the conversation, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.